And as a basis for our study, if you would turn to 2 Peter 2 and verses 20 through 22. Peter writes, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of, our, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But as it is, but, but is, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to, to her wallowing in the mire those who are Christians all, we all make mistakes in life I, that's just the way in which life is and we as Christians even though we're trying to do our best uh, we will make mistakes. But the greatest, or possibly the greatest mistake that a Christian can ever make is that of backsliding, falling back into the world, or apostasy. Our text here gives us a, a picture of a Christian who has fallen back into the world. He, that has apostatized, One, an, a Christian who is backslidden. In spite of the teaching of some, the impossibility of apostasy, Peter expresses, here's one who has. And he reveals to us that the backslider's condition is worse than at the beginning is the way in which he puts it. And when we think of the individual's beginning condition, well, he was lost. He was separated from God. He was bound from, for an eternity in a devil's hell to be tormented throughout eternity. But now then, Peter says, the backslider, that person who's, gone, who's become a Christian and gone back into the world, his condition is worse than that. It seems difficult for us to understand how an individual could be worse off than someone who's lost and never obeyed the gospel. But yet Peter says that is the situation, that's the case with the backslider. No doubt we all can think of numerous individuals in our lifetime who has fallen back into the world, those who are backsliders. They, uh, there are some that will go off into denominationalism, some leave the, any type of religion. Some just float around doing nothing. But there are a lot of people who, in the world who were Christians and who have fallen back into the world. But backsliding, that sin, can be and should be prevented in one's life. It is a preventable sin. Nobody has to fall back into the world. In Romans, the second chapter in verse 1, while Paul is talking to the Jews, he says, thou, uh, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. Thou art inexcusable, he says. Backsliding is a sin that really is, to a certain extent, inexcusable. And yet, there is the temptation 
for all of us and that all of us face on a regular basis of going back into the world. But it takes effort on our part not to do so. And it takes effort to remain faithful. So in this lesson, uh, this afternoon and Lord willing next af uh, Sunday afternoon, I want us to notice some preventatives to backsliding. Those things that will help you and me as we live our lives so that we will not fall back into the world. So that we will not apostatize. And we'll want to discuss four different things, basically. The first of those can be stated as let God say something to us every day. Possibly there's no better way to prevent backsliding than this very thing. The psalmist... Uh, probably David in the 119th Psalm. The whole Psalm really is a, a glorification of the Word of God. But in the 11th verse he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Very clearly here's the preventative to backsliding is what the psalmist says. When I put God's word in my heart, that's going to help me not to sin. When we look at Jesus and the temptations that are recorded for us in Matthew, the fourth chapter, every time Jesus met the temptation with, it is written. He had God's word in his heart and thus he did not sin against God. And yes, he could have committed sin, otherwise it was no temptation. Otherwise he would not be our high priest if he could not have sinned. But he did not because he had God's word in his heart and thus he was able to meet the temptations that Satan would bring his way. Yet, sadly, there's many Christians who go day after day without ever looking at the Bible. Except maybe to see it on a shelf or someplace over on the side without ever opening it up and without ever studying it. They refuse in that sense to allow God to say anything to them. They just go on their merry way and then they wonder when temptation comes and they fall into sin, why they sin. And it's something else that comes up a lot of times is why didn't God help me do, overcome this? Well, he gave you the power to overcome it. You just haven't availed yourself of that power. The power is in the word of God. Yeah, remember, we talk about a lot of times Romans 1.16 that here's the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God into salvation. And we think of it's able to save us from our past sins. Wash our sins away. It is. But it's also the power of God to salvation in the sense that we don't have to commit sin. It can help us and will help us to overcome that sin. We really... And you go back to Hosea, the fourth chapter, in verse 6. My people are destroyed. Why? Hosea, why are God's people destroyed? Well, he said, for lack of knowledge. And he, claim, he states that they've rejected knowledge, and thus God is going to reject them. Well, how did they reject knowledge? It wasn't that they said, it's not true or that they stood opposed to it. It's simply that they didn't know it any longer. The Lord's church at one time used to be known as a Bible reading and a Bible knowing people. But that's not the case anymore. Sadly, we're not known that way. Because we've gotten away from reading and studying God's word. 
I know in a lot of congregations who at one time in their Bible classes, they would always ask how many daily Bible readers. And they would keep a record as to how many daily Bible readers there were. I don't know of a one congregation that does that now. Not one. There might be. I don't know all congregations, obviously, but uh, I don't know in my personal knowledge of one that does it. And yet, at one time it used to be common. Why did we quit? Why did we stop doing that? Maybe it's because there were so few of them that we didn't want to embarrass everyone. We don't allow God to talk to us, to say anything to us. God has many things to say to us, though. And, and really, our attitude should be a, a desire, an anxiousness to listen to what he says. Uh, Jesus states in Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 23 and 24, that if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you, and, ye, and unto you that hear shall more be given. If you have ears to hear, let him hear. There should be that anxiousness to hear God's word. And yes, we're to take heed what we hear. What we hear so much today, though, is trash and garbage and vileness and wickedness and evil and sin. And then we fail to go to that one place that is the epitome of right and good and justice. And we just don't pay any attention to it. We just put it on this, you know, put it on the counter or wherever we keep the Bible and there it stays until we need, to need it sometime. You know, in the old time, when Paul and Silas were going around preaching the gospel, they went to, after Thessalonica, they go to Berea. And it says that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. We need to be searching the scriptures. We need to find out what God has to say to us. In the 119th Psalm again, that great Psalm, in the 105th verse, the psalmist would say that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If I want to know how to live, how to walk, then I need to go to God's word and be reading and studying it because that's what's going to show me the light as to how to walk. How do I overcome these things that are in my life? I can tell you, we can't figure it out on our own. If we go to the philosophies of man, they're not going to give us any advantage. The only thing that's going to help us overcome all of the problems that we face within our lives is God's Word. Doesn't matter what it is, if we want to overcome those obstacles that, God, that Satan places in our way, it, no matter what it might entail, it's going to take going God's Word and studying it. God's Word meets all of the problems that we will face. You cannot find a problem that's not going to be dealt with, at least in principle within the pages of the Bible. That's why he, David could say that. It's a light unto my feet. A light unto my pathway. I can see clearly as to how to walk because of God's word. Now, when we fail to go and read and study it, that light is extinguished as far as our, light, our life is concerned. 
It's not lighting our way if I've not studied it. Our joy, our delight should be in God's word. There's something that you really love within life. Uh, whatever it might be, you really love that thing. Uh, can you just go, you know, well, I'll think about it in a couple of months now. Or next week, I'll think, I might uh, see something that sparks my interest in it again. Now you'd say, that person doesn't really care about that. He has passing interest. He doesn't really love it. In the very first psalm, David begins, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight. Notice it. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. In other words, here's where he finds his joy. It's in God's word. the 119th psalm again in verse 97 he says oh how i love thy law it is my meditation all the day notice in that first psalm he says in his law doth he meditate day and night now then he meditates all the day now then, meditation is not that meditation that we've been conditioned to think of that where a person sits with his legs crossed or folded and his hands out and saying, Om. Mm -hmm. Meditation, from a biblical standpoint, is thinking about something, dwelling on it within our mind. That's meditation. How can you dwell on something in your mind if you don't really know anything about it? You can't. It's an impossibility. And yet, here's the psalmist expressing our meditating day and night, a constant thinking about dwelling upon God's Word. Why? Because I love it. I have a delight in it. I find a joy in it. Can you imagine? I know some of y'all like football as well as I do. You need to learn the, right, learn the proper team to root for, but uh, some of you. But uh, can you imagine football game? And then it starts getting to the fourth quarter and the game's real close. Man, I wish this thing would hurry up and get over with. I'm tired of this. <laughs> That's, can you imagine someone like, you'd say, that person doesn't love football because he doesn't find a delight there. How many times were we like that with God's word, though? Or is it, oh boy, we got some, even if it's going into overtime, especially, this is going to be good. And we can't get enough of it. Why? Because we love that. We find a, a joy, a delight there. That's the way it is to be with God's Word. And our letting God say something to us is not, as we look at the scriptures, it's not just a mere glance at them. It is really a, an intensive study of God's Word. When Paul tells Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The King James uses the word study. American Standard came along and give diligence both ideas are expressing the aspect that we are looking closely and it's taking a lot of effort. There's going to be an, an intensive 
looking at and studying and learning in relationship to God's Word. Not just, uh, you know, a casual reading where we don't even pay attention to the words that we were reading. That's not going to do it. Jesus told the Jews of his day, Search the Scriptures. For in them you think that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, yes, he was talking about the Old Testament when he says this, but the application is just as true to what we would see today in relationship to the New Testament. Search. Not just a casual reading over of the Scriptures, but search them. That's in diligently going in and studying those things. Learning what's there. There's a lot of things that we can take care of with just a very casual, you know, looking at it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I mean, that's pretty simple. Doesn't, doesn't take a great deal of in-depth study to, learn, to understand that. You think you can do the same thing with Re the book of Revelation as you can with Mark 16, 16? No. It's going to take a little bit of study. You might have to learn the historical background. What's going on at the time. You might have to, in fact, uh, you know, uh, until I came here, I had never taught the book of Revelation. I always got out of it but by telling people, before you start studying the book of Revelation, you first need to understand Ezekiel and Daniel. And when you understand those books, then you have a, you're prepared to study Revelation. Nobody was really willing to put in the intensive study on Ezekiel and Daniel to ever get to Revelation. And that's the truth. You need to understand those books. You need to understand the figures of speech that are being used. You need to understand the symbolism of the book. You have to understand these things. But that takes time and work and effort. That's what God expects of us. It takes the proper reasoning within our minds. God gave us a mind. It is a logical mind. A mind that has the ability to think through and reason. To, in fact, uh, he tells the Israelites, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. We are to reason properly concerning the scriptures. True study of the scriptures... We talk about methods of Bible study. One of them is inductive and deductive. Inductive is you take everything that the Bible says about a given subject, and then deductive, you deduce from all of that information something that is harmonious to all of it. When I, I've told individuals that in the past and had the response, that's too much work. Bible study is work. Notice that, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It takes work, it takes effort. But I can guarantee, once you start putting in that effort and that study, there is so much beauty within God's word, it becomes so much better, so much more beautiful than if you just have a casual knowledge of it. It's hard to find, though, someone who has fallen back into the world who really studied intently every day in God's Word what happens is, you can almost count it, someone who has fallen away, 
we look at faithfulness so many times from the standpoint of their attendance at worship. Before they ever started missing services, they stopped reading God's word. They stopped allowing God to say anything to them. And then sin comes in. That's when they start apostatizing. So we need to allow God to say something to us every day. Second, we need to say something to God every day. In, well, we mentioned 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 this morning, pray without ceasing. And that doesn't, as we said this morning, uh, mean that every minute of every hour of every day is spent in prayer. It is an attitude that an individual has that he is a praying person, that that is characteristic of his life. In Luke 18 and verse 1, says that concerning Jesus that he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't slack up in your prayer life. You need to be a praying person. To do less is really becomes an attitude of ingratitude on our part. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, he tells us to be careful for nothing or nothing be anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. With thanksgiving. A part of our prayer life is recognizing our dependence upon God and thanking Him for all of the blessings that He has given unto us. How many times do we sing the song, Count your many blessings and name them one by one. And remember that part, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We need to be a thankful people. Prayer, part of prayer is thanksgiving. Colossians 4 and verse 2 again states, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So you continue it with thanksgiving. Because that's the attitude that we need to have in overcoming the things of this world. Someone has said that prayer will stop sin or sin will stop prayer. You will not find, in other words, someone who is committing sin who's a praying person. If they're going to be living in sin, they don't pray. They stop prayer. However, you see a praying person and you see that individual stopping their sin. It should be no surprise to us. Look at what happened when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his death. Here's Peter, James, and John who's, whom he has taken in with him to the innermost parts of that garden. He separates himself from them for a little while and he comes back and he finds them asleep. And he tells them to watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26 and verse 41. Watch and pray. Why? Because there's sin out there. Satan is going to tempt you and the way in which to overcome the temptation, in other words, the way to stop sin, is to watch and pray. Luke put it in Luke 22 and verse 40, that when he had, was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. So there's the need for prayer in relationship to our sins. The psalmist again in the 66th Psalm in verse 18. 
would say that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity, if I'm living in sin, if sin is a part of me and in my heart, then God's not going to hear. The fact is that if my attitude is to harbor sin in my heart, though, I'm not even going to be praying. I will stop praying. Again, well, Solomon, Proverbs 28th chapter and verse 9, says that he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. There's that individual, turns his ear, his ear from hearing God's word. He no longer listens to God. What is it? His prayer is an abomination. He's not going to be praying because that's not part of him any longer. He has separated himself from God so that he can live and harbor this sin within his life. He may continue to put on a good front for us, he may even come to services and portray himself as a righteous individual. But when he's harboring sin in his heart, he stops praying, even though he's portraying himself something else. But prayer does avail. We mentioned this this morning as well in James 5 and verse 16, to confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Again, applying that specifically to the subject that we're discussing, backsliding, falling away, entering into sin. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If I'm praying, help me overcome sin. In that example prayer, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Help me to overcome sin. Help me to look for that way of escape that you've provided. Help me to center my life upon your, thy word and to study it. When Satan comes and he places these obstacles in my way, help me to look for thee and to turn to thee for strength and for guidance. And when we're praying in that way, James is saying prayer avails. It's going to help. It not only helps us, uh, when you pray for something, your mind is attuned to that for which you pray. I guarantee you, you cannot talk about something that you're not thinking about. You can't do it. It's an impossibility. I guarantee if you start talking about something, you're going to think about it. Thus, prayer helps us attune our minds to that which we need to put it, put it on. But it also affects God. And yes, we have that promise in 1 Corinthians 10-13 uh, that there is not a temptation taken you but such as is common to man. That ought to give us some consolation right there. That there's nothing that I face that's, that's no one else has dealt with. This, it's only happened to me, it's not happened to anyone else. Well, I've got a sad, sad fact coming, it's happened to others. It's common to man. But then he says, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, if I'm praying to the Father to help me find that way of escape, number one, it's going to attune my mind to looking for that way of escape. That's going to help me overcome sin. But it also 
affects God, and God, through his providential means, is there making that way available to us. Prayer avails much. And so we need to not only allow God to speak to us in studying his word, but we need to be speaking to God. Not just daily, but several times every day. It should literally characterize our life. And no, I realize when we're discussing prayer, you don't have to stop and bow your head in order to say a prayer. You can say a prayer in your mind without ever saying any words. I realize that. That is a part of praying. My thinking about that supplication to God but supplicating God to help me overcome sin. Or when this is placed in front of me to help praying to him to help me overcome it. To help me through it. Or see me through it. When we do those two things, we have a good start for preventing backsliding. Now, at Lord willing, next Sunday afternoon, we'll look at two more things but this gives us the basis right here as to overcoming sin within our life and to prevent that sad state of affairs that Peter talks about there in 2 Peter 2 and verse 20 through 22. That here's in an individual who has fallen back into the ways of the world, a Christian that's fallen back, and the latter end is worse than the beginning. But... We need to be that individual who has left the things of this world and become a Christian. Who we need to escape the pollutions that are in this world through lust. It comes through a knowledge, he says, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. By the way, that knowledge comes by the revealed word of God. And so through God's word and a study of that word, I can come to know about God and I know about Jesus Christ and I know the sacrifice that he made for me on Calvary's tree, the suffering that he went through, the reason that he did it, not for his own sins. He was just, but he did it for my sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5. And he tells us what I must do then in order to be cleansed of those sins. That upon that faith that he did those things for me, that gospel system, we repent of our sins, we make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son. We're immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Or for, as Paul was told, the washing away of those sins. Those sins are washed away, they're taken away. I'm clean, I'm pure, and now then I can live for him. Living the way that he sets forth within my life. Overcoming sin within my life. But when I fail in that overcoming of sin and I go back and I've backslidden, God allows a second way of pardon for that Christian who's gone back and that is through prayer. That we can repent of our sins and make and confess those sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you have that need this afternoon, or that need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and being baptized, then why not come as we stand and sing the invitation song?